I want to now turn to Jean, and I'd like to take us up to Greece. And Jean, if you would, I'd love you to tell us a little about Internews's work in Greece in a situation that seems to me very chaotic with people who are arriving, but they don't know where to go or what to do. Could you tell us a little about your work there and how Internews is responding? Thank you. Thank you, Dale, for hearing your story. So two weeks ago, I was sitting in Victoria Square in Athens, meeting with a woman I'll call Hafiza, who had just recently arrived from Afghanistan. Hafiza is the type of woman that we all would love. We'd love to have her up on the stage with us. She was working for an international organization in Kabul promoting women's rights. And two years ago, her husband was murdered for his work and her life was turned into chaos she, and her life with her three children. As a single mother living in Kabul, she couldn't go back to her hometown. It was too conservative, would not accept her. She was facing increasing threats for her work. So two months ago, she made the really difficult decision to leave, to uproot her life and the life of her children. She managed to get a flight to Turkey and then three weeks ago took the boat over to Greece a boat ride that can often result in, in it's just terrifying, and, and can often result in death, but she put her children on that boat. Hafiz is now in Victoria Square, where she is, uh, where a lot of the Afghan refugees converge in Athens. She's entirely capable of figuring out how to, in a temporary basis, manage her life in Athens. So she has one desperate need, and that need is for information. She needs to know what now. She sits in the square because that's where Afghans are talking, that's where smugglers are coming, that's where some amount of information is flowing. But she needs to know, is she gonna be deported? What does the EU-Turkey agreement mean for her? What, what, when can she start her journey back to Europe? What now? It's because of people like Hafisa that I'm here. Internews is a 34-year-old organization uh, dedicated to ensuring that people everywhere have the information they need to make good choices for their families, to engage with their community, and to hold their governments accountable. Our core work focuses on building local independent voices for, of locally relevant and trusted information for everywhere around the world. We do this because experience has shown that when people have information, it's a root solution to advancing social, economic, and political progress. But information is also a form of aid, a fact that dramatically plays out in the refugee crisis around the world. And so I'm, I'm hoping our conversation today will make, help us all sort of understand that this somewhat unconventional form of aid should be a basic humanitarian service just like food, water, and shelter. So let's, let's turn to the Mediterranean crisis. And I've got a couple of slides myself. So those will come up. Yeah. So we went to Greece early last fall. Uh, that, did I just knock that? Can we go back one? Thank you. Um, when we arrived the, we, um, in, in Greece to help fill the information needs of the refugees, we focused on some really, really basic facts. While many travelers were um, carrying cell phones, when they landed, they didn't know what to do. There was no information. They needed basic information like a map that showed them that they landed on an island, that they weren't on mainland Greece. They needed to know where the first point of support would be, which was 60 kilometers up the road, lots of hills, not a very good walk, how much ta taxis cost, when the buses would arrive. They needed some really, really basic information. Uh, so we were able to provide this information via these maps. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and while the information was simple, the delivery was really tough. These are not all Arabic speakers. We had Farsi speakers. We had many, many different languages coming, many, many different levels of literacy, many, many different levels of access to technology. But the, the, but the information itself was fairly ba basic. The posters were just a start. We, we knew and we learned and listened and understood that the information flows for refugee populations primarily is through word of mouth and through um, amplified by smartphones. So much of the information, unfortunately, becomes rumors and misinformation, and some of it can be quite dangerous, most of it originating from the smugglers in Turkey. One really insidious example of a rumor was that many refugees were told that when their boats were approaching the Greek shore, they should, they should puncture them, because any boats that were viable would be immediately sent back to Turkey. So people were putting themselves in danger because of this rumor. In response to this, we created a program to complement the posters called News That Moves, 
And this is a, uh, an online information system and a rumor uh, tracking system that we disseminate in a whole variety of different ways, online, via mobile apps, on posters, in flyers, sort of every which way that we can get information. And this was originally to reach the people all the way on the line into, into Europe. But as you know, on March 20th, the situation changed. The doors to Europe slammed shut. IDP camps are now becoming uh, detention centers, and the dreams of asylum are now becoming fears of deportation. So given the lack of clarity, the what now question is becoming all the more complicated. It's less about where to go and where to find services, and much more about really complicated asylum laws, really complicated and still unclear government procedures, and often buried in layers of national law and international law. And there's so much uncertainty, the complexity of information is, is all the more important. And we know that the flood of people making these life-changing journeys aren't just across Europe and through the Middle East, but it extends to places like South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and elsewhere. I'll let you jump in here. <laughs> no, I did, because you're making a point that I think is so important that we think of the need for tents and immediate food and life-saving assistance, when actually, if you take a step back, what you've said is that information is critical to just getting to those places where people can be helped. And there's another point that you make that I want to um, kind of highlight, which is that people are now arriving in places where they don't know where to go or what to do. In fact, a decade ago or more, most refugees were in camps. Today, more than 50% of refugees no longer go to camps. They forego camps because they see that those places are dead ends, and they end up in cities, in urban areas. And in those places, there are no systems set up to help them. I know from our own work in Kenya that we've done research and found that the first 72 hours of somebody's arrival in Nairobi is like a ticking time bomb. That's the time when they're subject to trafficking, to taking into dangerous relationships. They need information first and foremost, and there are no systems set up to help them get that information. So what you're talking about is fundamental, and I think highlights a new dimension of this kind of global crisis and how we have to orient ourselves. You are then going to go down to South Sudan in a situation of internally displaced people, and we'd love to hear more about that. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you for, for making those points. So in South Sudan, there are currently 2.3 million people who are displaced by civil war and by uh, uh, devastating food insecurity. Uh, after Syria, it's one of the highest concentrations of displaced people in the world. And the IDP camps of South Sudan grew up in the civil war, and they mostly surround the UN missions and the peacekeeping missions there. And unlike in Europe, the IDP camps are static. The people, in fact, the camps are completely closed because people that are in the camps are really, really afraid of the people outside of the camps. That's part of the civil war going on. So their information needs are, are very, very hyper-local, and they're, they're also very complicated given the situation in South Sudan. There's an extraordinary lack of media in South Sudan. In fact, 34% of people that we interviewed recently had never even had access to a mobile phone, let alone television, internet, or radio. There's extremely low literacy, 26% literacy amongst adults. And as I said, for safety reasons, the people that are in these um, IDP camps, it, it, the information they need is highly localized. It's incredibly dangerous if anything goes out outside of the, of, the, of the communities themselves. So traditional radio reaching these communities was out of the question. In this environment, a program called Boda Boda Talk Talk was born, and that's what, what you're seeing in, in the photo here. Boda Boda Talk Talk is a bi-weekly radio audio program that's broadcast on megaphone, by megaphone attached to a quad bike, which is the Boda Boda. That's where the Boda Boda comes from. These bikes rove around the camp and, and to listening posts, and they play the programming on a, on a bi-weekly basis. The programming itself includes information about how to navigate life in the camp, but it also includes entertainment, it dispels rumors, and basically is aimed at reducing the tension and the pressure in such a difficult situation as a completely closed IDP camp. Boda Boda Talk Talk is produced by community correspondents who they themselves live in the camps, and this is a really important point. As humanitarian information is most credible, most impactful, when it's produced by the community from trusted voices of the community, and when effective, humanitarian information can save lives and begin to prepare people for whatever comes next. So the issues facing the populations in South Sudan and Europe are really, really different, but they, are, they have three big commonalities. The first is 
even though we are amazing as international organizations, we know that local communities are the first true responders to any crisis, and information is the lifeblood of their ability to respond. Second, at an individual level, information builds agency and dignity, and it helps people themselves take responsibility for what next happens in their life. And finally, information isn't just, doesn't just inform during a crisis, but it's the primary currency of resolution of crises. That communication, the need for building mutual understanding or facilitating reconciliation, it starts there. It starts with information. So for these three reasons, investing in systems that build, support healthy information flows, strong independent voices supported by appropriate technologies, it's so critical in our response today. It's also a human kindness. It helps people gain some control over their future. It helps them answer the question themselves, what now? Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Uh, you're bringing me back to my time in South Sudan and working with the Sudanese lost boys. There was a wonderful movie about them, mm -hmm. The Good Lie, that highlights their story. Of course, it actually overlooked girls in that story. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the needs in South Sudan, we, we talk now about losing a generation of Syrians, but in fact, with the conflict in South Sudan between 83 and 2005, we've already lost a generation of South Sudanese who had no access to education in that time. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to the audience, to you, for questions. Uh, please raise your hand, and I'll point to you for questions one at a time. If you're called on, please stand up and introduce yourself, and please keep questions concise to allow as many participants as possible to speak. We're also taking questions via Twitter, so feel free to submit them using hashtag GPF16. So who would like to pose the first question? Right over there. Um, good morning, Francis Charon from the Foundation France. I would like to come back to the, uh, the, the, what I've said Jane. Jane said about information. And um, it is a very important point because we are always thinking in matters of, of food, of uh, water supply, of health. But information is something which is really important for refugees. Imagine somebody arrived just like that, they don't know where to go. It's like that if you arrive here, you know nobody, and it's worth for them. So there is a huge task with that, because even the organization who are working there are not able to know the information. And uh, I remember when we were in Haiti or in the tsunami, we set up some center of information. And information must have must be in many languages too, because in these places where refugees arrive, they speak about three, four, five languages. So set up a sun, uh, some center of information, and after using the network through uh, high tech, through, through phones and tablets, would be very useful. So I guess you can uh, give us give us more information about. Uh, what you have done and how it's possible to set up this network of information which is really crucial before over, over all. So maybe I'll just qualify that question. Um, I think you were asked, Jean, to provide more information on what you do. Maybe I'll just tweak that a little to highlight that we want to get upstream from conflict as well. We want to think about the situations, the environments that we can create that um, that prevent conflict. You do a lot of that work in fragile states. Could you perhaps mention, because you've already talked about setting up information systems in Greece, in other places, what about in those places that are upstream from conflict? Well, I actually will turn, I was thinking I would talk a little bit about Afghanistan, but based on your question, I think I want to focus a little bit on Haiti. I in fact post earthquake Haiti, uh, where we went in and found desperate information needs. And one of the most important pieces is to work through local content creators, local journalists, local actors who are on the, you know, who are already trusted voices and already trusted service, um, sources. As an aside, one of the most frustrating parts about what we're doing in Europe is that we don't have those because it was such a moving target and the Greek community, working with Greek media didn't make sense for a long time because people were moving so fast. It's starting to make sense now and so we are starting our partnerships with the Greek media. But going back to Haiti, when the earthquake happened, most of the community radio stations around Port-au-Prince were just commercial stations playing music. 
And so we partnered with them and sort of taught them very quickly how to produce news and information, taught them very quickly how to engage with the international community. And what's great about that is, is now that the, now what used to be only a bunch of music playing commercial radio stations are now news producing community radio stations. And so that helps build the fiber and fabric in the institutions that you need for long-term stability, for long-term progress. And that's, that's what we look for, is, is media and information is a critical local institution that, that we all need all around the world.